Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. This is the first in a series of three videos about the three major types of chemical reaction. Our topic today will give us a chance to learn about one of the appliances you might have in your basement if you live in a place like Rockford, Illinois, where these videos are filmed. I just mentioned that there are three basic types of chemical reaction, so let's start by talking about those. They are precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and reduction-oxidation or redox reactions. Almost every chemical reaction belongs to one of these three categories, so if you understand these, you'll be able to understand a lot about all kinds of reactions that you see in the course and in every chemistry course that you'll ever take. In this video, we'll focus on precipitation reactions, and we'll look at each of the other two types in the next two videos. A precipitation reaction is what happens when two solutions are combined and one of the products is an insoluble solid. So in other words, you combine two solutions and get a solid called a precipitate as a result. That makes precipitation reactions very easy to recognize when you see one in the lab. For example, here's a chemical reaction that we first saw in the previous video. In this case, we combined sodium iodide and lead to nitrate. Both of those are aqueous solutions. You might remember from the last video that this means that the sodium iodide and lead to nitrate are dissolved in water. The products we get are aqueous sodium nitrate and lead to iodide. The lead to iodide is a yellow solid. That's the yellow stuff you see in the beaker. And that's what makes this a precipitation reaction. Remember, a precipitation reaction always has a solid as a product. If you look at the overall reaction that took place, there's a pattern that you'll see very often in precipitation reactions. The two reactants were sodium iodide and lead to nitrate, so the cations in them were sodium and lead. If you check the periodic table, you'll see that sodium has a charge of plus one, and from the name lead to iodide, you can see that the lead has a charge of plus two. In order to make the products, the two cations had to switch places. The sodium paired up with the nitrate and the lead paired up with the iodine. This is common in lots of different reactions. When this exchange of cations occurs, it's sometimes called a double displacement reaction, an exchange reaction, or a metathesis reaction. All three of those terms mean the same thing. The cations in the two reactants switch places. Let's try another example. Suppose we start with silver 1 nitrate and magnesium chloride. What will we get as our products? To start, let's write the formulas for the two reactants. This is something you should have learned to do in a previous video, but let's practice it again now. If you've forgotten how to determine the chemical formula by looking at the name, you should review that skill. It'll be useful for all the rest of this course. So we start with silver 1 nitrate. We can tell from the name that the silver has a charge of plus 1. And nitrate is one of the polyatomic ions you learned. It has the formula NO3 and has a charge of minus 1. Since the charges are plus 1 for the silver and minus 1 for the nitrate, we only need one of each to make the charges cancel. For the second molecule, we have magnesium, which the periodic table tells us has a charge of plus 2, and chloride, which has a charge of minus 1. So to make the charges cancel, we'll need one magnesium and two chlorines. So the formula is MgCl2. Now let's figure out what the products are. This will be a double displacement, so to find out the products, we just need to switch the two cations. The silver 1 ion will pair up with the chlorine. Since the silver has a charge of plus 1, and the chlorine has a charge of minus 1, there will just be one of each, so the formula is AgCl. The other cation is magnesium, and it will pair up with the nitrate. Magnesium has a charge of plus 2, and the nitrate is minus 1. So we'll need two nitrates to cancel out the charge on the magnesium. Finally, we need to balance this reaction. 
In this case, we have many different elements, but a good rule of thumb is that it's usually easiest to start by balancing the elements that aren't in a polyatomic ion. So we won't do the nitrogen or the oxygen yet. That leaves the silver, magnesium, and chlorine. The silver and magnesium are already balanced. There's one of both on each side. So we'll balance the chlorine. There are two chlorines on the left and one on the right. So we need a coefficient of 2 on the silver 1 chloride. Now the chlorines are balanced. But that messed up the silver. There are now two silvers on the right, but just one on the left. So we need a 2 in front of the silver 1 nitrate. And now that I've done that, this reaction is balanced. If you can't see that, you should pause here and take a minute to verify that the number of each element is the same on both sides of the reaction. So we know our products are magnesium nitrate and silver 1 chloride. But how do we know whether or not this is a precipitation reaction? Remember, in a precipitation reaction, one of the products will be a solid, so we need to know whether or not the products are soluble in water. How do we do that? To help us, there are a set of rules that tell us what compounds are soluble. The first rule is that any compound that has a cation from the first column of the periodic table is soluble in water. So that's every ionic compound that has any of these elements in it, including sodium and potassium. That takes care of a lot of different compounds. Also, any compound with ammonium ion as the cation are soluble. The second rule is that all compounds that have an anion of nitrate or acetate are soluble, no matter what the cation is. That takes care of another huge number of compounds. So far, the first two rules have been pretty easy to remember, but unfortunately the rest of the solubility rules will have exceptions. The third rule is that compounds that have an anion of chloride, bromide, or iodide are all soluble except when the cation is in this little area of the periodic table. Silver, mercury, thallium, and lead. You'll learn why these are exceptions if you take an advanced inorganic chemistry course. It has to do with the radii of the ions. But for now, I'm afraid you just need to remember these. So in other words, a compound containing chloride, bromide, or iodide, and one of those four elements will form a precipitate. The next rule says that all compounds that have an anion of sulfate are soluble, except when the cation is one of those same four elements, or the ones at the bottom of column two of the periodic table, calcium, strontium, barium, or radium. There are two more solubility rules to know. So far, all of them have described compounds that are all soluble except for the exceptions that we mentioned. The last two rules describe cases where the compounds are almost all insoluble, so these are compounds that are usually precipitates. First, compounds that have an anion of carbonate, phosphate, or sulfide are all insoluble except for the ones that have a cation described by rule 1. So these are all insoluble unless the cation is from column 1 of the periodic table or ammonium. And the last solubility rule tells us that compounds that have an anion of hydroxide are all insoluble, except for the ones that have a cation described by rule 1 again, or if the cation is from the bottom of column 2 of the periodic table, calcium, strontium, barium, or radium. Those six solubility rules cover tens of thousands of different compounds, including all the compounds that we'll work with in this course. So now let's use those rules. Here's the chemical reaction that we've been looking at. I told you that both of the reactants are soluble, and we can see that if we use the solubility rules. The first compound is silver 1 nitrate. And if you look at rule 2, it tells us that all nitrates are soluble. That means our silver 1 nitrate is soluble, and we can show that in the reaction by putting an AQ in parentheses after the compound. If you watch my last video, you'll know that this stands for aqueous, 
which means that the compound is dissolved in water. The second reactant is magnesium chloride, and Rule 3 tells us that chlorides are all soluble except for those four exceptions. Magnesium isn't one of the exceptions, so this compound will be soluble, and we can put an AQ after the compound. Now we'll look at the products. The first one is magnesium nitrate. Since it's a nitrate, Rule 2 tells us that this is another soluble compound, so we'll write AQ after it. And finally, the last compound is silver 1 chloride. Rule 3 tells us that chlorides are all soluble, except for those four exceptions. And silver is one of the exceptions. So that means silver 1 chloride is a solid. So we'll put S in parentheses after it. That tells us that silver 1 chloride is a precipitate. So this is a precipitation reaction. Next, let's think for a minute about what's happening to the reactant molecules when they dissolve in water. If you watched the previous video, you might remember that when an ionic compound dissolves, the ions separate in the water. That's what an aqueous compound is like. So with that in mind, let's look at this reaction again. The silver 1 nitrate is an aqueous compound, which means that the silver ions and the nitrate ions are actually separated from each other. So we could rewrite it this way. The same is true for the magnesium chloride, which is also aqueous. So we can separate the magnesium chloride into ions. Remember, all the ions in the molecules separate from each other, so you get one magnesium ion and two chloride ions. It's important to remember that you get two separate chloride ions, not a Cl2 ion, which doesn't exist. On the product side, we have magnesium nitrate, which is another soluble compound. So it breaks up into magnesium ion and two nitrate ions. The last product is silver 1 chloride, which is a solid. Since it's a solid, this one doesn't separate into ions, so we'll leave that one together. Although this isn't the way we usually write reactions, it's very helpful to see the ions written out this way. The way we wrote the reaction originally without the ions separated is called a molecular equation. The second version, where we broke up the aqueous compounds into ions, is called the total ionic equation. We can learn a lot about a reaction by looking at the total ionic equation. For example, in this case, you might have noticed that there are two nitrate ions on both the left and the right sides of the reaction. Also, there's a magnesium ion on both sides of the reaction. So all of those ions were present at the beginning of the reaction, and they were still present at the end. They didn't change. Nothing happened to them, and ions like that, which don't participate in the reaction, are called spectator ions. When we have the same spectator ions on both sides of the reaction, we can rewrite the reaction by dropping out the spectators. If we do that here, we'll drop out the magnesium ions and the nitrate ions. We don't drop out the silver ions, the chloride ions, or the silver 1 chloride solid on the product side, because all of those aren't the same on both sides of the reaction. Once we've dropped out the spectator ions, what we get is called the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation is especially useful because it gives us a way to know whether or not a reaction can even happen between two compounds. For example, in the reaction we just looked at, the net ionic equation shows us that what's really happening is that the silver ions and the chloride ions react together and form solid silver 1 chloride. Because the spectator ions aren't written in this equation, we can see exactly what's reacting. Let's use the same process to decide whether or not a different reaction is possible. We'll try reacting zinc acetate and potassium sulfate. Will those compounds actually react? We can find out by trying to write a net ionic equation. We'll start by trying to find out what the products are. If this reaction is possible, it'll be another double displacement reaction, so we find the products by exchanging the cations in the two compounds. 
So the zinc pairs up with the sulfate, and the potassium pairs with the acetate. The zinc has a charge of plus 2, and the sulfate has a charge of minus 2, so we need one of each in our molecular formula. Meanwhile, the potassium has a charge of plus 1, and the acetate is minus 1. So again, we just need one of each in our product. Finally, we have to balance the reaction. There are two potassiums on the left, and one on the right, so we need a coefficient of 2 on the potassium acetate. Now that we did that, this reaction is balanced. If you don't see that, you should stop for a minute and confirm that that's true. So, this is the molecular equation for this reaction. To find out whether or not this reaction will actually occur, we now need to write the total ionic equation. Remember, we do that by breaking the soluble compounds apart into their ions. So we first need to figure out what in this reaction is soluble. Our first compound is zinc acetate. If you check the solubility rules, rule 2 tells us that all acetates are soluble. So we can split this one into a zinc ion and two acetate ions. Next is potassium sulfate. Since potassium is in the first column of the periodic table, rule 1 tells us that this is another soluble compound, so we can split it into ions. We get two potassium ions and a sulfate ion. Now let's try the products. First, potassium acetate. Again, rule 1 and also rule 2 both tell us that this is a soluble compound, so we'll break it up into potassium ions and acetate ions. The last compound is zinc sulfate. Rule 4 tells us that sulfates are all soluble except for a few exceptions. Zinc isn't one of those exceptions, so zinc sulfate is soluble, and we can break it up into ions. For our last step, we'll drop out all the spectator ions to get the net ionic equation. That'll show us which things are actually reacting. Remember, we get the net ionic equation by dropping out the spectator ions. And the spectator ions are ones that are exactly the same on both the left side and the right side of the reaction. For example, we have a zinc ion on both sides, so that's a spectator ion. There are also two acetates on each side, so those are also spectator ions. There are two potassium ions on both sides, and a sulfate ion on both sides. So to get the net ionic reaction, we'll drop out all the spectator ions. And when we do that, we find out there's nothing left. So the net ionic equation actually has nothing in it. The net ionic equation is what tells us what chemicals are actually reacting. So in this example, we've learned that there is no reaction. No reaction occurs when we combine zinc acetate and potassium sulfate. Notice that this wouldn't have happened if one of the products was a solid, since solids don't break up into ions. You'll get a lot of practice in class figuring out whether or not different combinations of reactants will actually cause a precipitation reaction or not. The solubility rules we learned are an important help, so you'll want to have them handy as you work on problems like this. It turns out that precipitation reactions have a lot of applications, and one of them is important right in your own home. There are many places in the U.S. that have what's called hard water. Hard water is water that has minerals dissolved in it, and as a result, hard water contains calcium and magnesium ions. Unfortunately, calcium and magnesium form insoluble compounds with soap. That means that instead of going down the drain, your soap forms solids in your bathtub and shower if you have hard water. That's what soap scum is, and it can be really difficult to clean, and can also block up your pipes. That can be a real problem, so if you live somewhere that has hard water, you probably have something called a water softener in your house. A water softener takes the calcium and magnesium out of your hard water, and replaces them with a different cation. The new cation comes from salt pellets that you put in the water softener. 
These salt pellets are usually made of either sodium chloride or potassium chloride. Why does that help? Well, as I said, the new cations we've put in our water are either sodium or potassium, and these are both in column 1 of the periodic table. Our first solubility rule tells us that sodium and potassium compounds are all soluble. So these ions will keep your soap soluble and it won't form soap scum. Well, that's enough for now. Next time, we'll talk about the second kind of chemical reaction, acid-base reactions. Until then, have a good week.